and I am going to go to file and options and make sure we are using the metric automatic mode uh, because I do want to see things showing up as kilometers if we're working with that scale range and what we need to do is kind of decide the scale of our ecosystem now I'm gonna say that I do know already that this scale for our terrain and what I want the ecosystem to be. The terrain in the landscape is too small. Now, with the options we have for ecosystem creation, that is not a problem. It's just knowing ahead of time is pretty important. What I want to do is load in just a scale reference tree and right mouse click on the vegetation icon to load in a specific species and because the maple tree is a very fast loading tree very quick to render uh, I'm just gonna use the maple tree right now because it is one of the uh, more original trees for view it's been around for quite some time so it will load in very quickly now we don't see the tree in our scene so we need to switch to our four viewport mode and I'm gonna grab it and place it in front of the scene and our camera, raise it up a bit, and drop the object onto the terrain. And now if we take a look at the size for our maple, uh, this is pretty small for a maple tree. I'm going to double click to open up the maple tree and just grow a new variation and I did that just by clicking on the new plant icon and now we can see uh, we have a 24 meter tree and it's just slightly larger than what I want to end up with uh, because I do want the scene to be a little more vast and if we take a look at the atmosphere editor uh, if we go to the sky fog and haze tab I do have the aerial perspective increased in order to uh, add that illusion of height within the scene. Now the value is normally set to 1 uh, with the internal unit of 0.1 and that is closer to realistic atmosphere value. Because the scene itself uh, is too small, we need to increase that aerial perspective. Now this isn't a finite amount, uh, it's nothing I've really tweaked around with too much. I just want to mention uh, that if you are seeing the haze in the scene and the aerial perspective look, that's because I have it increased. So what I really want is something much smaller than this uh, to represent a tree that would be this size. So we are going to be reducing the overall scaling within the ecosystem. Uh, what I want to do now is improve our ability to create our ecosystem distribution and what we need to do for this is create a population zone uh, in other words pick an area of the terrain we can use to use the normal population option uh, and not the dynamic population uh, because we have a lot more control and a lot better of a visual understanding of the scene when we can actually see the instances. We can also use some of the master uh, ecosystem object population uh, to modify and edit the ecosystem uh, with these zones. There are several ways to create these zones and we're going to take a look at the different types because they can be useful uh, in different areas of the development. And you don't always want to use the same one. Uh, if one works best for you then definitely stick with it but if you find that the method you're using isn't working you can move on to one of the other types. So I'm going to show you all the different ways we can uh, zone out the terrain. The first is the most straightforward method. Uh, really quite simple and it's basically a matter of scaling the terrain to fit into uh, the zone. And what I want to do is select our landscape. 
and I'm just going to control C and control V to copy and paste or you can go up to the top and edit copy and paste now I don't want this other terrain or the original terrain to affect uh, the current terrain I have or even show up right now so what I'm going to do is create a new layer and we'll go ahead and name it zone landscape and we're going to drag our copy into this layer and call it landscape zone 1 and now what I want to do is just take our water and I'm going to be moving it out of the landscape in our primary landscape layer and I'm going to give it its own name and call it decay objects and that's because our water will be part of the decay near foreign objects and I'm just gonna minimize our main camera view so that we have more layer options to work with and now I'm gonna take our landscape and under the aspect tab the first tab where we have our material uh, I'm gonna make sure I'm ignoring this object when populating ecosystems and I'm just gonna go ahead and check on all these options which is going to hide it turn it off from the render uh, I'm also going to select our option up here to hide the terrain and click twice on the landscape layer with just the landscape in there and now that will no longer show up so we can see if we hide the zone landscape it doesn't show up in the scene turn that back on and now we just have this landscape zone 1 now what we can do since we're using the world uh, mapping mode is basically scale it down and just move to a position that we want to work with. So this is a really simple and easy way uh, to create a landscape zone for a population. And we can see it's just refreshing. So that way you could move this around in the scene and have it update and you'll never lose the geometry from your procedural. The only problem with this is you need to make sure you're not manipulating the z-axis, the scale, or the position. Now because of this there's another method I like to use uh, which I think is a little more effective. And what I want to do is use a control object or an object to set the size on the X and Y and the position of our terrain. And what I want to use is a cube. So I'm just going to go over to the left and we can add in a cube to our scene. Uh, the reason I'm using a cube uh, rather than using something like a plane is the coordinate system of a plane or an object plane is different uh, to the coordinate systems of other objects in the scene. So we can use a cube instead to match the exact same coordinate system uh, as a terrain. So this is going to be our control and we can position it above or below the terrain. I'm going to go ahead and position this below. And the Z scale doesn't matter, we're not going to be using it. Uh, it is going to stay independent for both objects. I'm just scaling it down because I want to uh, just reduce its overall Z scale so it's not intersecting with the terrain at all. So I'm going to control 
our landscape zone 1 with this cube so I am going to give this a name landscape zone 1 control and actually um, I think I am just going to name this zone 1 control because it is not a landscape so what we need to do is edit the graph of our landscape and making sure we're doing this with the copy we've created now if you need to remove the other terrain from the scene if you need to maybe clear up a little bit of memory or if you're having any display issues since we are creating duplicate scenes and we have these groups set up you don't need to worry about losing that procedural because of course we have it saved with other scenes I am going to take the time right now and create a new save version uh, variation number two uh, just another stage along the way and I'm going to save this again as number three for our future saves so two will be in the state right now and three will be any changes we make after this point so now we can open up our landscape graph going down to the lower right and I have created a meta node to control uh, this exact sort of setup uh, but I do want to just remake the node uh, so you can understand a little bit better how it works and we can create our own version of it so the first thing I want to do is add in a math node vector operation and I'm gonna add in decomposer or I'm sorry the composer 3 and what this node does is it takes three number inputs and converts it into a vector output and now I'm going to create the opposite version of this which is the decomposer 3 which will take a vector input and convert it into three number outputs basically breaking it down the X Y and Z as individual numbers and we're going to need another decomposer 3 so we can select our math node and then go over to the left and create another math node and the reason we're using two is because you want to separate that z-axis and we want the z-axis to be related to itself so what we can do is take input zero from the composer into the left decomposer connect the x and connect the y so input zero and input one x and y and now our input 2, which is the third connection, we're going to connect to only the Z of the decomposer 3 on the right. So we'll go ahead and name this Z, X, Y, and then we're going to just rename that vector X, Y, Z. So our decomposer and the XY is going to take the vector of XYZ and basically cut out the Z. Uh, it will not count. It's not being passed through the node. The right decomposer 3 will take the Z and pass it through and basically make the X and Y null. And they're not part of the number output. Although we can connect uh, if we wanted to other nodes. But basically, we can have two vectors to control the XYZ and this allows us to link the object Z of itself back to itself so you'll be able to see that in just a sec. I'm going to take these top three nodes and pull them down so we can zoom in a little bit closer and actually I'll just go ahead and zoom out once more and we're going to create a duplicate of this uh, because we do need two. We need one for the position and one for the size. So let's go ahead and select all three of these and create a meta node.
That also reset our position, orientation, size on top, so I'll go ahead and bring those back down. And I'm going to name this X and Y. And use the capital Z in brackets in order to show that the X and Y are combined and the Z is separated. So this is a constraint, and we can use it as an axis constraint. Although this will only work to the direction of the output. Uh, what we could do, if we go to edit the node, if we wanted to create the opposite connection, then we would create two composer nodes and one decomposer and set up the opposite sort of connection. And that way you could run it either to the input or to the output. In this case, we need it running to the output, uh, so this setup is fine. We do have a double output node that was created. Uh, even though we're not going to be using a double output, sometimes even when if I delete this option, it might still show up. Uh, what we do need, if we right mouse click, add an output node, we need a vector 3 output. And we can connect this to the vector. Call it vector XYZ. And now we have two vector inputs. So we need to add an input node, vector 3, and add another input node, vector 3. And we're going to call these x, y, and z. Actually, I'll go ahead and just make these lowercase just to separate that and now connect the Z to that output click OK and now we have two connections our two vectors the XY and the Z and then our output is the full XYZ if I go back to edit we can see that double output is still there and that's because we have open options primarily uh, from the decomposer nodes so what I'm gonna do is just call this null and that way we don't connect anything to it because it doesn't do anything. And now we can go ahead and save this out. So this is our axis constraint. And I'm going to load in a meta node, uh, which is that exact same node we just saved. So now we have two. And what we need to do is load in an external dependency. So we're going to add an input, external dependency, add another input of external dependency, one for the position and one for the size. Our external dependency will be our zone one control position for the first one and for the second one, zone one control size. We'll just name that position and name the other one size for what part they're connected to. Now we also have the position and size of the object itself and the landscape. We're going to need these in order to preserve our current settings and also have the ability to manipulate the Z scale independently and the Z position if we want to. So we're going to start out by taking our XY and connecting it to our external dependency, connecting the Z to itself, and connect that to the position. Now we can take the size and do the same thing. XY to the dependency, Z to itself, and the size to the vector, and the output. So now, if we take a look at our zone 1 control, move to, and switch to the move gizmo, we can now move this object instead of moving the terrain. So we don't need to worry about any interference and accidentally moving that Z. Because if we take a look and I move the Z position, it does not affect the terrain because we have it linked to itself. If I scale it up, it won't make any change whatsoever. So that is uh, pretty helpful.
Now, what I want to do in this case is because our water we really can't see in the top view. So what we can do is actually take this control, move it up so that it is positioned with our water or pretty close to it. Then we can select our water and hide it from the scene and set it to hidden from our aspect tab and the material. Zone 1 control has been created with the exact same material as the landscape because the object I had selected before I created it was our landscape. We don't want that. So I'm going to right mouse click and reset the material for our zone 1 control. Open it up and call it zone null because this is not going to be rendering. Which means we can turn off indirect lighting, cast shadows, receive shadows, uh, just so there's no interference click OK and we uh, want to click on the icon for the object to hide it from the render but we do want it to still show up in the scene. What I also want to do is set its wireframe color to blue and make sure that it is not affecting our ecosystem population. I'm gonna ignore indirect lighting and make sure it is occluded by the G buffer so if we want to break down the scene, we don't have to worry about this zone showing up in our G-Buffer. And now we can also see that water showing up and be able to see the object underneath it for our control. And in the top view, we can see that water intersection. So that's really helpful. What I also want to do at this point is make sure we're giving our landscape zone a different material name than our primary landscape. And that's because any modifications we make to the zone, if it has the same material, is going to affect the initial landscape. Or we're going to run into problems later because they are named the same thing. So I'm going to open this up, select our primary layer, call it landscape zone 1. And now these individual layers since they show up as their own materials, we also need to make sure that these have new names. So I'm going to put a Z1 in front of all of these material layers. And that way, we don't have to worry about any conflicts when we change any of the settings back and forth between the materials. It's really important that you set up a different material for this setup and just about every single object in the scene like I said you really want to make sure they have uh, separate material names in order to avoid any problems later so now we can click OK and we can see that all those names have been changed if we go back into our main landscape we can see this has still been preserved so if we open up the material uh, now we are seeing that we have landscape zone 1 and we're not seeing the individual material layers. And just for the sake of the material summary, I am going to select our zone 1 control, edit the material, and reset the color, and just set it to a blue. Change our options, and I want to change this to a marble so it's smaller so uh, we can separate that or we could set it to a cube since it is a cube in the scene uh, maybe in this case we'll use a cube just so we can recognize that it's the zone I'm gonna reset the color for the background and we'll keep it at that black set it to uniform I can turn off the local light setting close that out And now we'll have something that stands out a little bit better when we're using the material summary for our zone. And now I'm going to save a new variations of the, of the scene. Uh, give it number four. Save that out. And if you want to be able to preview the landscape in the background, And just in the OpenGL display, uh, not worrying about it rendering, 
but also making sure that the terrain itself doesn't take up too many system resources. Now in this case our scene is really simple. Having a few duplicates of the procedural terrain isn't going to make that big of a difference. But if you're working with a scene where you have several procedural terrains, uh, whether you have 10 or even 5, and you're noticing some lag issues or any problems with the system, then what we can do is since we have the save version, uh, we can always go back, plus the zone 1 uh, is still the exact same fractal uh, for the generation as the original. What we can do is convert this to a standard terrain, uh, just as we did before, edit our object, and we don't need to have a really high resolution. I'm going to bring it up just to 512, and then what we can do is convert this to a standard terrain, uh, just as we did before. Uh, what you could also do is export the terrain uh, you created in the other scene and import it in. Uh, but in this case, I want to just redo it just because it is a small uh, overall pixel amount. And I want to make sure there's no conflicts between the scenes. So we can click OK. And I'm going to just remove this material and reset it. So once again our landscape material uh, is going to be gone. Uh, we do have the zone one which is exactly the same uh, plus you can go back to the original uh, zone one scene and save out that material to bring it back in. Uh, but right now we just want an easy preview and you can really see the difference between the standard terrain and the procedural as it's showing up. And I'm going to call this land preview. Call it null. And we're going to click to hide it from the render. But we also want to select our other options and ignore when populating ecosystems so that it's not interfering with our population and I'm going to turn off the hidden option on our landscape. So now we can have a rough idea of what the initial landscape looks like plus our zone. So we can move this around if we want to see the absolute detail and with the standard terrain we can see the overall shape of the landscape. I'm going to go ahead and change our color to a green and that can separate it. If that's a little bit too bright uh, we can go to the automatic mode and edit our material. I'm just going to reset the color map, edit the color, and we'll just grab something similar to that green. And I'm going to turn off some of these other options just in case. And now we can see that showing up. Another thing you could do is uh, keep the original landscape material on and then paste that function uh, onto the bump in order to pull out that detail so you can still have a rough idea of some of the more defined areas. I'm not really worried about that too much because I'm going to be focusing on our zone that we've created. And this is an important part of the scene because there is water in it and we have an intersecting object. So we do want to make sure the zone is part of that. And then we can move this around in order to see exactly where everything is showing up. And if we want to hide that standard terrain so we can see the full zone uh, then you could just double click on the eye. First we'll lock the layer so you don't manipulate it and second we'll hide it. So if we want we can take a look uh, just at a quick render of what the scene currently looks like where we just have this 
small procedural terrain that is rendering very quickly now. Uh, we can see the water showing up, but of course we don't see the rest of the terrain. Uh, but this way we can really separate a lot of the different values. And now we can start to focus on our distribution of our ecosystem and starting to pick out our plants and of course create our ecosystem, which is the ultimate goal. And if you need to speed up the scene even more, and you have multiple zones in the scene, uh, what you can do is once you have the position set for your terrain and the landscape, you can select the zone and convert it to a standard terrain. Since it's such a small area compared to the larger terrain, you're going to have a lot more detail, and it might be a lot easier to work with that rather than a procedural terrain depending on your system speed and the performance of the scene. In this case I'm not having any issues and in most cases these smaller procedural terrains do not take up a lot of memory or system resources. So next we're going to be grabbing our distributions we set up already and applying them to the terrain and starting to use our zone to populate the ecosystem getting a good preview and then we're gonna set up all of our settings for it and get everything the way we want it try out some different areas for the population uh, some different zones and then we can move that over to a larger scene and piece everything together